these moral principles are still in effect. Now, how do we as a church handle all of this? What should our response be? How, how should we react? How, what should our approach be? I think we need to look very carefully at how Jesus handles all of this. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Jesus spent time with sexually sinful people, people that were labeled as dirty, unclean, filthy, and all kinds of other even more terrible names. And Jesus spent time with them. And he cared for them, and he loved them, and he drew near to them. And if that's how Jesus cared for sexually broken people, then we better be the same. We'd better do the same. We'd be better willing to be spending time with people that other people may want to just cast off. I came across a, a little expression, a little phrase, twice in the same week. And it's a phrase I'd never heard before. I heard it in two completely different contexts. And so when I, well, the one time I was reading in a, in a commentary on this passage, and the other time was just in a conversation with someone from northern Saskatchewan of all places. And he brought this up, and it was so completely random, but it was exactly what I'd read. And when I hear that, I sometimes start to think, maybe God is trying to tell me something. So I better pay attention. I want to share it with you. Here's the little expression. You've all heard, love the, love the sinner, hate the sin. Okay, now we've all heard that many times before, so have I. That wasn't anything new. But then this was the part that I heard twice in one week that was new. We're pretty good at hating the sin, but we don't do very well at loving the sinner. And that was a challenge to me. And it's a challenge I want to share with you. Because I think, actually I'm certain, that's what Jesus wants his church to do. He wants it to be a place that's safe for people who struggle with sexual brokenness. It must be a friend to sinners, a welcoming place, whatever that sexual brokenness might look like. Um, now some of you are sitting here thinking, well, wait a minute. Sounds like you're just giving a whole endorsement to this and you're shrugging it off. No, because the other thing that Jesus did so frequently is he called sinners to repentance. You remember the story where the woman was caught in adultery and they were about to stone her. Now Jesus didn't say, Come on, let her go. It's not such a big deal. He didn't. He said to the woman, I don't condemn you. No one else will condemn you. I don't condemn you either. And then he said, go and leave your life of sin. But you see, it was the grace that Jesus demonstrated that called this woman to obedience. And as a church, we need to do that as well. We need to be a place that calls sinners to repentance and faith in Jesus. But that, that calling can't just be angry wagging our finger in people's faces. It's a calling that's rooted in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, that's going to be a challenge for us. And one of the challenges that we're going to face is that it's going to feel sometimes like we're standing up here and all those, those people struggling with sexual sins, whatever they might be, they're kind of down there. And we're going to feel like we're looking down on them sometimes. And you know, that's a dangerous place to be. It's a really dangerous place to be, spiritually speaking. If you really want to love and call to repentance and faith, we need to be standing on level ground. And that will only happen when we all, each and every one of us here, recognize that sexual brokenness affects all of us. All of us. I mean, when Jesus says you shall not commit adultery, he doesn't just leave it at that. He says, if you so much as think wrong and in inappropriate thoughts in your mind, then you've already broken the commandment. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for me that I can't say I'm innocent of that. And I don't think any one of us can. We could go down a whole long list of sexual sins and label them all and single them out. We're not going to do that but I'm going to remind you that when Jesus says, when he talks about sin, it's not just in action, but it's in thought. It's in word. 
as well as in deed. And that leaves none of us off the hook. We're all broken. We're all fallen. Sexual sin affects every last one of us here. We're all in need of our Savior. We're all in need of the grace that that calls us to repentance. We're all in need of the grace that can change us and can compel obedience. And here's the good news. Jesus came and he died for sexually broken people. He died to show mercy and grace and forgiveness and healing and restoration. 